the M1A2 main battle tank. The weight classification is 68.7 ton. Has a crew of four. The gunner, tank loader. The driver, sir. My job is tank commander on M1A2 tank, sir. 120 millimeter smoothbore main gun. It's 150 caliber machine gun and two 7.62 machine guns. Most definitely. One awesome piece of equipment. They are unquestionably the big dogs of the modern battlefield. Brute-powered monsters that can compel enemy behavior just by their presence. Who wouldn't run in the face of a rapidly advancing, unstoppable steamroller? That was the image tanks conjured up when the idea was first pitched to a young bureaucrat of the British Navy during the trench warfare of World War I. Winston Churchill was in the Admiralty. The Army had looked at the design for a tank and rejected it, said it wasn't feasible. He was briefed on it and thought it was a great idea and had the Navy complete the design and, and build the tanks. World War I was fought along sprawling fronts between armies so dug in that they might as well have been underground. The great battles consisted largely of suicidal charges across barren neutral zones. Defending forces swept no man's land with machine gun fire. For months at a time, the killing continued, but neither side made progress toward victory. Churchill recognized the potential of the tank a vehicle that could fight its way to the enemy's fortifications and silence their machine guns could turn the battle. Well, the medium or heavy tank, and the, what we call today the main battle tank, is to me uh, very much the same as the ancient heavy cavalry. Its job is to provide a heavy blow to the enemy and to be able to do it swiftly. Armor technology, in theory, quickly advanced. Tank development became a game of one-upsmanship. The quest for a perfect tank, and for the perfect tank destroyer, was on. To succeed, tanks had to maintain a balance of speed, firepower, and protection. The dominant tank would get to the fight first, attack with accuracy from outside enemy defenses, and deflect enemy projectiles with impunity. Achieving a working balance of those three was difficult. Strengthening one leg of the triad tended to weaken the others. Offense and defense improved in tandem. With every advance in armor, there came an advance in anti-tank firepower. Armor that was at first riveted together was abandoned for solid cast when explosives got powerful enough to blast through the rivets into the tank's interior. Flat surfaces gave way to smoothly sculpted angles that would deflect projectiles the way an airplane deflects wind. Advances relative to the state of the enemy's art tended to be incremental, gaining only temporary superiority. The United States, planning for an enormous confrontation with the Soviets on the plains of Europe, introduced the M60 in 1960. It was, by all accounts, a pretty good tank. It was faster than its counterparts in the Soviet bloc light enough for air transport, but well protected with a 105 millimeter main gun and an anti-aircraft machine gun. But it wasn't perfect, and planners knew that it would not be long before Soviet designers discovered and began to exploit the M60's weaknesses. With that in mind, Army planners in the early 1970s began looking forward to a new main battle tank. They designated the tank the M1, and named it after General Creighton Abrams. As a young tank commander during the Battle of the Bulge in World War II, Abrams broke the critical siege of Bastogne with a forward thrust so swift and devastating that even Patton was amazed. The tank could not have been more aptly named.
In the early 1970s, Pentagon planners started laying the groundwork for the new Abrams tank. Despite a troubled and controversial development period, the Army and contractor General Dynamics designed a tank that, in theory, came closer to meeting the tanker's ideal of speed, firepower, and perfect protection. The balancing act was complicated. The first job of any tank is to protect its crew, and that grew more difficult all the time. The M1 had to defeat two types of weapons. First, there were high-explosive anti-tank, or heat munitions. Heat charges focused the force of an explosion on a point the size of a quarter, melting its way through foot-thick armor and splattering the tank's interior with molten metal. Secondly, there was a new class of kinetic energy weapons that, upon striking armor, fired a heavy metal rod through the armor, spewing metal fragments around the interior. To stop both types of rounds, Americans borrowed a new kind of armor first developed by the British. Though its precise makeup is still classified, so-called Chobham armor is made up of layers of metal, plastic, and ceramic materials. Rather than merely deflecting an enemy round, Chobham armor breaks projectiles up into small pieces and then dissipates their force. The M1's crew compartment is one of the safest in the history of armor. It has a fire detection and suppression system that uses harmless halon gas to smother flames in less than one second. Because forces on the modern battlefield face threats other than mere artillery, the Abrams tank has advanced nuclear, biological, and chemical protection. That NBC capability guarantees that the crew will be safe even on a battlefield so polluted that it would kill an unprotected person. The Abrams was also designed for speed. Traveling at more than 70 kilometers an hour, it required a huge amount of power. The new tank ended up with a 1,500 horsepower gasoline turbine engine that had more in common with the jet engines on fighter aircraft than it did the standard tracked vehicle. With more power per pound than the M60, driving the M1 Abrams was unlike anything to come before it. The fastest I ever gone is about 36, 37 miles, sir. I drive the tank uh, from a steering column, which is actually called a T-bar. It has straddles like motorcycle handles, and that's how I control my speed when I drive the tank. And I love to drive fast. there is a few bumps. For the most part, it's a, it's a very good smooth ride. The M1 deployed in 1981 with a 105 millimeter gun. The gunner, sitting in the right front of the turret, had a laser rangefinder and periscope at his disposal, which was nice, but trying to aim while the M1 sped along would have been impossible without a sophisticated fire control system. The main battle tank's main battle gun is controlled by a system of gyros and hydraulics that keep the gun pointed straight and level even while the tank isn't. To protect against infantry, the tank carries three machine guns. Atop the turret are a 50 caliber operated by the tank commander and a 7.62 millimeter controlled by the loader. Mounted at the front of the turret is a third machine gun that sweeps in exact tandem with the main gun. Tanks were made in World War II to signs to add to the fear and the fright uh, to scare the infantrymen. But there's uh, the other aspect that that lone infantryman uh, has the capability to destroy some tanks if he's uh, brave enough to withstand it and able to conceal himself and has the right weapon. 
On paper, the M1 was clearly the best tank in the world. In testing, it remained the best, though not quite so clearly. Critics pointed out that the tank was not only over budget, but there were problems with the engine, tracks, and suspension. The complexity of the system seemed to imply that in battle, the breakdown rate would soar. The Abrams also needed a new gun. The 105 couldn't handle the new generation of armor-piercing shells being developed to defeat the Soviet equivalent of Chobham armor. Dubbed the M1A1, the new tanks had a 120 millimeter smoothbore gun and improved crew protection. Sandwiched into the already incredibly strong Chobham armor were a few layers of depleted uranium, a metal so dense it is almost impenetrable. The improved tank could also mount what is called reactive armor, plates that explode on contact, knocking incoming rounds backwards before they reach the tank's skin. Of course, in tank development, every answer leads to a new question. The bigger gun and added protection raised the weight of the tank more than seven tons. That's a lot of weight to put on in a couple of years. That weight requires additional automotive power, which requires additional fuel, which also requires additional spare parts. You wear out track, you wear out road wheels much faster when you're in a heavy piece of equipment. The Abrams tank requires a tremendous amount of logistics. Without the logistics, you can't keep tanks running. It's no wonder that the doubts about the Abrams tank had more to do with maintenance and logistics than they did with the tank itself. The debate over the M1A1's viability on the battlefield was still raging when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Good or ill, the argument was about to be settled. In the Persian Gulf War, a generation of untried equipment received its battle test. The Patriot missile, the A-10 Warthog, and the F-117 Stealth all proved themselves, but none was more successful than the Abrams main battle tank. If you were going to design the perfect geography for tank battle, it would be hard to beat the Arabian Desert. It is enormous, stretching across a subcontinent virtually unbroken by rivers or forests. It is essentially a huge tank range, a perfect arena in which to demonstrate the strengths of the Abrams tank, speed and firepower. The M1A1, with its big gun and advanced fire control system, was effective on the move from 3,000 meters, more than two miles. The Iraqi T-72 seldom knew they were under attack until they blew up. When the Iraqis did get a shot at the M1A1s, they generally missed. And if they hit the Abrams, their shells bounced harmlessly off. You gotta imagine yourself with somebody with a, with a long rod penetrator that's um, a large dart, let's say, traveling about 3,000 feet per second. And if that slams into you, are you going to know that you got hit by something? Sure. Um, but the tank is designed to be able to provide the crew protection against that. The speed of the Abrams tank made possible General Norman Schwarzkopf's Hail Mary flanking maneuver. Columns of Abrams tanks advanced at nearly freeway speed, cruising around Hussein's World War I-style fortifications and cutting off the Iraqi army's means of escape. There are several accounts of uh, tank crews that were capable of hitting enemy targets on the move at a range of 3,800 meters, which is a phenomenal distance to be able to, to see because the enemy was not capable of seeing and engaging us um, at those same kind of ranges. There's no such thing as an invulnerable tank, although to my amazement, the Abrams tank uh, comes close. It provides tremendous armor protection. There's very little that can destroy 
It has a gun that can destroy just about anything on the battlefield, and it has the uh, ability to get there faster than any other tank we've ever had. But as good as the desert was for tank tacticians, it was a logistical nightmare. The desert sands invaded every system, grinding machines to a halt. Crews had to be well drilled and conscientious in their maintenance. And of course, you expect uh, any piece of equipment when you're using thousands of them, uh, not all of them are going to run every day. There's going to be mechanical breakages. So the Army looks at how many uh, a percentage that are, are up and running and available for use every day. And the uh, percentages exceeded training percentages in combat. With all equipment, you always come back to the soldier. Uh, the soldiers were uh, not any more capable than they were the year before when they went through training exercises. But they were inspired, if you will. You've got to depend on it, so you, you, you sort of treat it like, um, like you would your car. You ensure that you, you fine-tune everything and that uh, the little noises that you hear that you know aren't normal, you know something's wrong. You know where to go to about that. Mm -hmm. There was an article that I read about uh, a U.S. Marine Corps Reserve unit from the state of Washington who had M68 tanks, M68-3 tanks, in their normal day-to-day -day training in the National Guard in, Washington, in, uh, in the state of Washington. They were alerted in December that they were to deploy to Desert Storm. They went down to 29 Palms, California, where the Marine Corps got a, uh, got a training facility set up. They did a new equipment training, very intense, very concentrated new equipment training on the M1A1, deployed to Saudi Arabia, drew their tanks, went out and did some basic training in terms of maneuvering gunnery, etc., in the desert, and then went into combat on the 24th of February. These 13 tanks in this tank company killed 35 tanks, destroyed or stopped another 59 and then a host of other combat support service support vehicles and never lost a single tank. I mean, that's, that, that just tells you right then and there that the tank is a great tank, um, that it's, it's user-friendly to the point that you can take somebody who's never been on one before, give them an intense training period, send them out to do their job, and they can, in fact, succeed in combat. So the, the, the marks are high on the M1A1. The Persian Gulf, though a resounding victory, was not without its lessons. The great speed of the Abrams made it clear that some new method of battle management would be necessary. To lift the fog of war, tanks had to be not just strong and fast and deadly, they had to see better than they had ever seen before. The post-Persian Gulf variant of the Abrams tank, the M1A2, has very long eyes. What we're, what we're currently doing in the military and in the armored force with the fielding of the M1A2 Abrams version tank is we are essentially integrating the microprocessor computer into a combat vehicle. There are certain things that computers or machines do um, better, faster, more accurately than humans. It is fitted with the commander's independent thermal viewer, an all-weather, all-terrain, all-night tank vision enhancer that radically improves battlefield awareness. The A2 brings in some interesting capabilities uh, in that the commander and the gunner can now work as a more complete team. Uh, because as the gunner is conducting engagement, the commander with the commander's independent thermal viewer can be searching out the next target. And when he is, when the gunner's done with one engagement, rather than having to call him left or take control of the gun and bring him over and have him look, he can hit the slew button, the gun will slew right over tell you right, you know, take them right to the target. They can share that information. It allows for subsequent, subsequent engagements to go much more quickly. At the same time, the Army is deploying a system that should limit friendly fire incidents. The Inter-Vehicle Identification System, or IVIS, is a computer-based communications network that pinpoints and identifies everything on the battlefield, friend and foe, in real time. The revolution stands things on its head and completely changes the way that we do business. My personal opinion is, is this is probably more of an evolution at this stage of the game. The M1A2 and IVA systems are, the Army believes, a stopgap measure until the development of the next generation of tank, the future main battle tank. Whether the FMBT will be new from the ground up or a third variant of the almost two decades old M1 
remains to be seen. An M1A3 would be cheaper, but an all-new FMBT would bring capabilities to the battlefield that today exist only in computer models. It takes for a major system 15 years from concept to deployment. Almost certainly, the Abrams main battle tank, conceived as a temporary fix nearly two decades ago, will be the mainstay of the American Army for at least a decade to come. <laughs>